Hey pals, I'm here today to do a bit of a hodgepodge video because I haven't filmed a video on the main channel in about a month and so I thought I would do like a life and bookish catch up video and then talk about like maybe like a quarterly check in type thing, talk about if I'm achieving my bookish goals and if not how I plan to catch up and then talk about all the books I have up from the library currently that I'm hoping to focus on in the next few weeks so sort of like a bit of a book haul as well. I will say that I started this video a few minutes ago and it's been a fairly rainy windy day here but just as I began a hailstorm started and just massive hailstones really loud thunder and I wasn't sure if my mic would pick it up but it was so distracting for me like it was so loud here that I stopped recording waited it out and it's gone in about five minutes and now it's bright sunlight so I'm using my studio light for this video but I fear that the light's still going to change because I don't think the studio light is going to be able to compensate for bright sunshine and then so dark as almost night time so apologies if the lighting changes in this video. So firstly yeah I've, um, I've been a bit rubbish in the last month which is a shame because I had grand plans this year to uh, yeah really commit to try and doing um, one Patreon video a week and two videos like on the main channel a week and that hasn't gone brilliantly this month or March I should say which just wasn't a great month for me sort of health wise um the first couple of weeks I had some like digestive problems <laughs> and was just pretty uncomfortable for a couple of weeks and um sort of as soon as that got somewhat under control I caught a cold which I think was probably tonsillitis because like I sound like a drama queen but honestly it was horrendous I was in so much pain and I couldn't talk for about three days and um, I could barely eat I could like if I needed to swallow a sip of water I was frightened uh, because it was so painful um, and I was just not myself for quite a few days because I felt so unwell and um, I realised quite how important talking and eating are to me I always knew how much I love to eat um, and I know I talk a lot but yeah it was shocking how much less I felt like myself when I couldn't talk or eat um, Johnny said he felt like he'd lost me for a few days there so it made me realise quite how much just general shit I chat at him really boring stuff and just everything I think or see I um, relay to him which he must find delightful um, so yeah I ate a lot of mashed potato that Johnny made for me and I watched some truly horrendous films um, because you know when you, you don't feel well and you can't read because it doesn't like take your mind off it enough I needed something sort of mindless on TV to watch that sort of would so that's what I did instead and um, watch some absolute shockers and um, yeah and that sort of took up a couple of weeks to be honest it took me quite a while to uh, get my voice back completely and um, to not just sleep all the time so yeah now I'm back and I'm feeling really positive um, going forward about um, catching up on content and I've also this is a complete aside but um, got into baking this year I've got into um, baking but also got into just trying lots of new recipes so this is really boring but I realized that what was holding me back from trying a lot of a lot of baking but also a lot of other recipes was just not having the ingredients I needed and it felt like a real like an investment to buy a lot of the ingredients so I sort of uh, allowed myself myself like a big blowout food shop where I just ordered loads of um sort of store cupboard essent not essentials really but I guess kind of essentials for a vegan diet if you want to cook a lot from scratch and then lots of baking stuff and I really loved it it's been it's been fun to try a lot of new recipes um I'm keeping a diary this year and each month I've been writing down every new thing I've tried um and most of them have been successful like Johnny and I've really enjoyed most of them um there was a one that was like a, a braised red cabbage um with was it like a butter bean mash and it actually tasted delicious but it said to use a whole red cabbage and I don't know if the person who created the recipe used a small one but it was like an insane amount of cabbage like I could have fed like a family of eight um so yeah that was a bit of a ridiculous one and I probably wouldn't do that one again um because it was the most difficult one I did as well I think but um, it, it was tasty um but yeah I've been loving baking um as I said I'm vegan and I'm really fortunate in being vegan in a city like Norwich because there's just a lot of vegans and vegetarians here and so it's super easy for me to like buy cake and I pretty much eat cake every day which I know is super unhealthy but it's just you know my favorite thing and so it was expensive for me to 
like buy like you can't it's difficult to buy like uh, a whole vegan cake um like from a supermarket or something so I always buy like a fresh slice of cake like every day so I've learned to bake and it's so much cheaper um although perhaps not healthier because some days I'm like oh I need to eat two slices so the cake doesn't go off so I'm trying to um bake when I know we're going to be seeing people so I can then like offload some of the baking on them which isn't really very me because I find that really cringe um because I, I don't like that people then feel that they have to like congratulate you on your on like your skills and stuff so I just find it a bit uncomfortable um but my brother very helpfully um, didn't make me feel like the other day because I let him try some of my chai spiced banana bread and he said it was stodgy and uh, too spicy for him. So <laughs> siblings will always tell you the truth. Everyone else is like, oh yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing. And my brother was like, nah, had a better one the other day. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that is what I've been up to. Um, still super sunny, so I'm hoping the light isn't too weird, but I've started, so I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on now. So um reading uh should we chat about that let me get my story graph up so i don't have to do all this from memory usually if i did like a quarterly update i'm really anal and would like only talk about the books that i read up to the end of march like the quarter i just can't be bothered to be that precise today so i am going to talk about what i've read up to like now today's date and that will be obviously past a quarter slightly so i've read 26 books which is to be expected in terms of my reading rate for the past couple of years. Um, a lot slower than I used to read around 12 books a month on average. So like I'm, I'm fairly behind on that. Um, and my aim was to read 120 books this year. Um, that being 10 books a month. And I'm actually nine books behind um, with that. And then I wanted to read 50,000 pages. Um, and I've read 7,755 pages. So I'm... Um, 6,726 pages behind so yeah very behind although I'm currently reading like four books so it, does, it hasn't factored in those pages so I am a bit further along than that and then my other two um, not other two I think I had three other reading goals which I made challenges on my story graph I really like that about story graph that you can like create challenges so one of those challenges was to read 20 memoirs I've only added two to, because you can like add them to the story graph page, which is very helpful. I've only added two. One I really enjoyed, and that's How to Say Babylon by Safia Sinclair. And one I didn't really enjoy, which is Missing Persons or My Grandmother's Secrets by Claire Wills. I perhaps have read more, although I'm being a bit weird. I've read a couple of graphic memoirs, but I'm not including those because when I said memoirs, I meant like not graphic memoirs. So I'm not including those. So I'm very behind on that challenge. Um, because I should be further ahead than two out of 20. Um, I wanted to read 10 translated books and I have read two. Um, so again, behind, I need to have read another two by the end of the month, but I do have two translated books, um, which I'll mention in a bit, which I'm hoping to achieve that with. Um, and then read 20 non-fiction books. And I didn't want to include um, memoirs within that. I wanted that to be like what I would call like informative non-fiction books. I'm very much behind with filling in these prompts because it says I've only read one. Um, if I have only read one, then that is not good. Let's have a little look. I think it probably is only one, which is very bad. Again, I have um, some books set up to, to read for that. I think it is only one. Yes, it is, that's really bad. So yeah, I, I'm really failing with the whole um, non-fiction thing. So I definitely need to get on that. So basically I'm failing with all of my goals. Um, I'm feeling sort of okay about that. Um, I. It's weird because I've always considered myself to be like an autumn winter person and I'm not taking it back like autumn is still my favourite season but last week we had quite nice weather um, in the part of the UK where I live and I was very much enjoying going for walks and just seeing lots of lovely long grass and blossoms everywhere and it feels much nicer to go for walks and I'm someone who gets quite hot when I walk so I don't love having to wear like big um, thick coat so it's been quite nice to be able to just go out in like linen and stuff and not have to worry about that and I felt quite free um, and I've pretty much lived in like some linen cohorts I have and it looks like Johnny said the other day have you washed them this week because you want them like every day and I had but I pretty much washed them dried them in the evening and then just put them straight back on the next day because they just feel like pajamas so I love them um, so yeah, I've completely forgotten what my train of thought was there. But anyway, what I was going to say is I find now, since we've lived in a, in a place with a garden, 
that I read more in the spring and summer because I end up thinking, well, I'll go sit outside when it's nice and I'm less likely to be like pulled in to watch stuff on my phone because I can't see my screen very well because of the sun. So I do just sit and read for a few hours, which isn't something that is mad, but like as a reader, that's not something I do very often. Um, I probably read in like 40 minute stints um, and I have to be like really engaged with a book to sit and read it for a prolonged period. Um, but I definitely do do that more in the spring and summer, I think. So. Uh, so I, I think going into this season, I should be able to catch up a bit with my goals. Okay, so Albus has just entered the room and immediately started kicking off at me. So <laughs> I apologise if you hear. He is, I love him to bits, but he has an incredibly annoying meow. Um, it's just like really whiny. Luna has a, like a super cute meow. Albus does not. So yeah, apologies if you hear that. And he may try and like jump up around the books and knock things over. We shall see. So... I thought I would chat about what I'm currently reading. I always tend to be reading a few books at a time um, and that is the case at the moment. So I will talk about those first. Let me just grab them, not real prepared, am I? So I'm reading two books physically and two books on audio. So let's talk about the physical ones first. Both of these are new 2024 releases that I have treated myself to. One of them is Rabbit Heart, A Mother's Murder, A Daughter's Story by Christine S. Irvin. This was on my anticipated releases video, which I will link above. And what I've been doing is trying um, for books that I can't get from my library that are very expensive because they are not published in the UK. If possible, I've been reading a Kindle sample and I read the Kindle sample of this and loved it. And so immediately thought, Do you know what, I'm OK with spending like over £20 on it. And so I ordered myself a copy. I am about halfway through. It's only around 250 pages. And I will say this is um, one of the most triggering books I've read in a long time. It's very difficult. I wasn't expecting it to be quite so hard to read, which is maybe a bit naive to me when I tell you the premise. So this is a memoir. This author's mother was abducted when the author was eight years old. She was at a shopping mall. She was walking out, I think in broad daylight to her car and lots of witnesses saw two men drag her into her car and drive away with her. And her body was found many days later um, in an oil field, I think many miles away. Um, and her body was so affected by this sort of natural elements, being out in the, in the natural elements for days that they couldn't precisely tell what had been done to her leading up to her death, but obviously it was horrific. And it is about, the author's life from the point of being told this but I guess what I hadn't expected is what this really delves into thematically is the fact that from that point onwards you would expect her father perhaps to be the type of man who would then raise his daughter to be really aware of the patriarchy and the the power that a lot of men hold and will abuse and to be really aware about things like consent and all these things and that is the opposite her dad is very much a man of his time perhaps to extremes at points and there's many moments in her life where she approaches him and tells him that that people for example her doctor are like inappropriately touching her and making her feel uncomfortable and her dad's like well it's up to you if you want to say something you can but like it might make it a little bit awkward for you when you want to go to the doctor again um, so it's really frustrating and it's it's sort of focused on that and it's focused on the fact that Christine really struggles in, in wanting to feel connected to her mother and to understand precisely what happened to her mother. She sort of ends up in a lot of situations in which she is being sexually assaulted and at the time she's not 100% sure that's what's happening but when she looks back on it she is and she describes these moments in quite a lot of detail. She also sort of imagines what may have happened to her mother in quite a lot of detail. So there's quite a lot of graphic descriptions of sexual assault. And so I'm taking this one quite slowly because like the other day I read like 30 pages and I was like, that was a lot. So it's very well written. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm enjoying it, but I'm glad I'm reading it. And she's a very good writer, but I, I would just preface this with that it is a memoir that is not at all shying away from the gory details of what happened to her mother. Um, and I think that will probably continue for the second half. So there is that one. So yeah, that, that's one that I would um, struggle to recommend to a lot of people I know. So yeah, just uh, yeah, have a think about whether that's something that you would be okay with reading. 
And then the other one is one I picked up recently. This is a, another new release that was also featured in one of my anticipated releases videos, which I'll link above. Uh, my bookmark is falling. And that is We Are Together Because by Kerry Andrew. So this is a weird one because it, it came out in March and I don't know whether that's a bit of a mistake on the publisher's part because this book is set in France in the summer. And so initially I was like, oh, like I want to pre-order this to support the author, which I did because I've enjoyed both their previous books. But like, I feel like I want to read this when it's sunny, but then it, it has been sunny the last few days. So I started it and then um, it started raining. Although the sun has now come out again, like I said, so um, it's okay. So I'm about a third of the way through this. Um, the premise is, is that there are these two pairs of siblings, right? Um, two sisters and two brothers. They have the same father, but different mothers. The father basically had the two sons and left their mother for the other woman and had the two daughters but the middle children the son and the daughter are only six months apart because he basically got like both women pregnant at the same time and so because of that the, the siblings never really knew one another and now as teenagers they're all getting to know one another and the father has sent them to his summer home in france and they're getting there a week before he is to sort of all hang out together and you are told at the start that their father will never see them again and that the chunk I've read feels a little bit like conversations with friends in that like um, we're following the, this group of uh, people um, at a villa in a hot country and it's all about yeah it's the sort of minutiae of their interactions with one another there's a bit of awkward sexual tension between um, one of the sisters and one of the brothers um, and and they all very much have their own like thing that they're interested in. And so you sort of hear about that thing through each of them. Like for example, um, one of the brothers is a deaf in one ear and he is really interested in sound um, and the way sound travels and the sound of silence. And so he spends all his time on the holiday recording sounds and then um, editing these sounds together to make um, another interesting sound. But right from the start, there's these mentions of weird things happening so for example the brother who's obsessed with sound can hear a constant ringing that nobody else can hear when he asks them to listen to the recordings so something's going off there the younger sister thinks that the color of the sky is changing she's quite interested in color so she thinks the color of the sky is changing she also sees what she thinks is a plane falling from the air and there's these inserts every now and again about things that creatures around them are doing that are not natural um, and have never happened before and so you get the sense that this is veering towards like post-apocalyptic end of the world type situation and it's kind of interesting because this first section doesn't feel like that at all other than certain hints um, so I'm interested to see now I've reached part two like how much the novel will shift tonally and um and yeah See where this goes and then on audio i'm only about an hour from the end from the road to dalton by shannon bowry i think is how you say her name and i'm absolutely loving this one this was featured in my five star predictions video which i will link above and what i did is i uh, selected 15 books i thought i would give five stars based on the premise alone then i read the first chapter of all of those books and um like responded and said whether i still thought they'd be five stars and this was one of the ones that I thought would be like four and a half stars. So I wasn't super confident, but it's 100% feeling like a five star read to me. I'm loving it. And when I initially listened to a sample of the audiobook, I wasn't sure about the audiobook narrator, but I'm so glad I stuck with her because this is set in Maine. And I think that really worked to have someone who's doing all the accents. Um, this is set in a small town in Maine called Dalton in the 90s, I think precisely in 1990. And you follow um, a group of characters in this town. It's very much slice of life. And through each of them, you are finding out about um, sort of secrets and dark things that are um, sort of hidden. Um, it's very much a novel of its time and place. They're the type of things that um, were not discussed in the 90s, especially in small rural communities. And it is beautiful i'm loving all the details i'm really interested in all the characters um there's one story down in particular about a mother who very clearly has postnatal depression and that's not something that anyone really recognizes in this time and place and it's incredibly difficult to read um her sections and yeah i'm just really enjoying how you sort of hear from one character's perspective 
and see how they view things and then hear about them from somebody else um, and, and yeah sort of get this uh, this bigger sort of mosaic of this place um, it's made me realize how much I really like small town stories so please feel free to recommend them to me and um yeah, I have a few more lined up in my TBR because I'm listening to this on Everand and um, Everand like put little uh, categories and one of the categories was small town stories. Um, so I clicked on that and added a couple to my um, audiobook save list, but let me know if you have any others you would recommend. And then the other book I'm listening to on audio is Brotherless Night by V. V. Ganeshanathan. I haven't listened to this one in about a week because I paused to listen to The Road to Dalton, but I will go back to this one once I finished that. So I was trying to read the Woman's Prize of Fiction long list and um, I'd already read two when it was announced. I read a few more. Um, I felt quite meh about a few of them. And then I picked up Brotherless Night and I am actually enjoying Brotherless Night and intrigued to see where it goes. And I'm enjoying it on audio as well, so I'd recommend that. But I just felt really uninspired by the idea of like reading through the list. I don't know, as soon as something becomes homework to me, it sort of takes the joy out of it. And also I feel so excited about some other reading plans I have. I'm really excited about loads of the books on those lists. And yeah, I just sort of didn't want to hold off getting to all those books for the sake of making one video about the Woman's Prize. So I have allowed myself to just give up on that. So I do still have some books that I'd requested from the library that I haven't cancelled my hold on because they still sound great and I want to read them. Uh, I'll talk about those in a moment. But um, a lot of the books I just cancelled my hold on and yeah, I'm not going to sort of rush to read them or may never read them at all. Uh, if when the shortlist is announced, it's a group of books that I do want to read, I might just read and review the shortlist, but that's not something I am promising by any means. And I'm less likely to do that than I am to actually do it. So like I said, I'm enjoying Bravelous Night. And the one thing I'll say about it is it's quite slow to start, which isn't always the best thing for me on audio. Um, I wasn't really great with audiobooks when I started it, which has probably sort of um, slowed my entry into it. And like I said, now the weather's nicer, I'm getting back into walking and stuff, so I'll definitely get through it uh, quicker. Um, and the other thing I will say is that I think there's four brothers in the story, um, and it's not always easy to follow them all once you're get just getting to know them via audio. So like, I can see why in some ways, the physical route would be the better way to go. But I think the audiobook narrator is doing a really good job. I'm really enjoying the story. It's from the perspective of a young girl, um, which I love. And I thought the opening, um, the sort of introduction about the fact that the author, the sorry, the narrator says that she's someone who we may call a terrorist, but she wants to sort of tell you how and why she came to be a terrorist and how terrorists are just ordinary people who are sort of pushed to extreme things, I thought was a brilliant opener. Um, so I immediately felt compelled to continue with it. And I think this is one of the books on the list that's getting um, a lot of positive reviews and that completely makes sense to me. So like I said, I'm hoping to focus on a couple of reading projects I have. And the first one I've already mentioned is reading my five star predictions. And so I, like I said, I made 15 predictions. I, Once I'd read the first chapters, I thought that six of them would be five stars and seven of them I thought I'd give between three stars and four and a half stars. I'm reading the seven first just because those books were easier for me to get hold of. Um, so The Royal to Dalton being one of them. I picked up a copy of Flatlands by Sue Hubbard. I also predicted I'd give this one four and a half stars. I just really feel like reading this type of book at the moment. I'm really in the mood for sort of slow paced character focused historical fiction which this is. And then one of the other ones that I think I said in the video I thought would be a three or three and a half stars kind of surprised me because I thought the premise sounded really interesting. It obviously included it as a five star prediction. But then lots of people in the comments said, I really think you would actually really enjoy this. And like perhaps the first couple of chapters aren't like a great reflection of where the book ends up going. And that is Little Monsters by Adrian Broder. So I borrowed a copy from the library um, and, and actually, even though I didn't love those first couple of chapters, I feel like it will be a book that I'll get through quite easily, which is something I'm really in the mood for. I'm in the mood for a book that will just keep me turning the pages. Um, so I will be getting to this one shortly. Um, this next one, I'm actually, again, quite in the mood to read quite soon. And that is Where the Trees Were by Inga Simpson. This is an Australian book um, with a sort of a past section about four younger school friends and then a present section, which has sort of a mystery to it. And then the other TBR I'm focusing on is that I did a video, and I'm rubbish at explaining this, where I chose 20 books books that other booktubers had put in their favourite books of the year video for 2023 um, and 
they were from less than 20 booktubers so from some booktubers i chose like four recommendations from some a couple from some one and i'm trying to work my way through them now i feel like what i'd like to do is rank and review all of them in one video just because i think that makes the most sense but i fear that will be too long because i like to talk you know at length i would say about books when i review them so like how should I do this? Should I read 10 and rank and review those? Read the next 10, rank and review? Or should I? And I think this is probably the better thing for you as a viewer, but harder for me in terms of my memory, is I should read all 20 and then do a part one and part two where I talk about like my least favourite 10 and then my most favourite 10. Um, but that just means that I'm going to read them over a longer period and I have to remember the ones I read a few months ago. So, so let me know. But I have a few, of, I've read a couple already and I have a few more out from the library. Um, one of those I've mentioned before is um, Rianne Bell by Priya Hine. This is a, quite a short book, so I will get to this one very soon. Then we have a book I've meant to read ever since it came out because so many people with similar reading tastes to me have said how much they adore it. And that is Tell the Wolves I'm Home by Carol Rifka Brunt. And then one I probably need to read quite quickly because I've been in the queue for this one for ages and there's loads of people behind me is Northwoods by Daniel Mason. I don't like the UK or the US cover of this book, which I know is quite controversial because I've heard loads of people be like, oh, I love the US cover or I love the UK. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of either. I feel like the font is just like, this isn't very good because it's very shiny, but I feel like the font is too big or like this is a good image, but it's like just too zoomed in. Does that make sense? So, right, I read the prologue and like half of the first chapter of this when I picked up from the library a few days ago and I'm not convinced. Um, I love the idea of this, that this is set in one location um, and each chapter brings you forward. I think maybe this happens in the 1600s and then each chapter is a different time period bringing you closer to the present um, and it's set in like an apple orchard and yeah I really like the idea of that but um yeah I didn't feel that drawn in by the language used in that first chapter um so I'm wondering whether I should audiobook this one because I looked and it has like nine different narrators. So I think there's probably like a different narrator for each chapter, which could really work in terms of like the accents and the different ways people would have spoken in historical time periods. So let me know your thoughts. If you've read this or audiobooked it, um, what do you think? And then I've just realised I've left one of the books um, to meet this list somewhere else in the house because I'm intending to pick it up and start reading it today just because I'm really in the mood for it. So it's probably like on my bedside table or something. And that is Year of Wonders by Geraldine Brooks. Um, this is a, a plague novel, it's a historical novel. Um, when I picked up all the books from the library the other day, I always read the first couple of pages and I thought the opening paragraph of this book was beautiful. Um, it was describing um, the sort of start of autumn and how the season felt a little bit different and I just thought it was wonderful um, and I'm very much in the mood to read that and it's kind of interesting because Northwoods is about you know this um, house that's like, like I said like, I think like an apple orchard or something and um, Year of Wonders sort of opened um, probably in a similar time period to that first chapter of Northwoods with descriptions of the apples and I just was way more compelled by the language in Year of Wonders so um yeah, just, I don't know, thought that was worth mentioning. So there's that stack. Um, I'm super excited to read all of those. And again, it's sort of like a five-star predictions because it's me choosing books that other people have raved about that I think I could love. So um, I think that's going to be like my focus for the next couple of months, reading all those books. And hopefully that means I'll just come to you with lots of joy and talk about lots of books that I'm really loving. And then I have a few books that I'm just going to briefly sweep through because, um, sweep through, speak through, because I've spoken to you about them before um, and I'm just mentioning them because I like when people do like library check-in videos and talk about like which books they've returned, which books they've kept out. And so I thought it was worth sort of mentioning that these are still on my radar. So I always have my limit of 20 books out, always, because I'm always reserving books, always borrowing quite a lot of new releases. And so quite often I have to return books I haven't read. I actually sat down yesterday and went through every book I'd borrowed this year, like on my library app, and marked which ones I wanted to re-borrow um, because I still wanted to read them. Um, and that's definitely worth doing because I think it's quite easy to sort of forget that. And then, um, yeah, some books you were really excited about that you just didn't get to because of time constraints to sort of, yeah, not remember them. So these books have survived me taking books back and I still have them and still intend to read them. And the first three are new releases. So, you know, I need to read them and get them back to the library for other people. 
first one is Winter Animals by Shani Lewis. This is actually quite short. This is supposed to be a bit of a like dark thriller about privilege. I think it's filled with unlikable characters, which is why I haven't picked it up, just because I haven't been in the mood for that. But um, yeah, I would like to get to it ASAP. This one somebody else has requested, so I need to read this in the next week or so. And that's Interesting Facts About Space by Emily Austin. I've just noticed how awfully bitten my like nails are and like the skin around my nails. I apologise. Like I said, March has not been a great month for me. Um, so I've just been really bad with um, constantly gnawing on my hands. So sorry that that looks rank. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like a comedy. Um, I really enjoyed her first novel. Sort of has like kind of Fleabag-esque humour to it. Um, so when I'm in the mood for that, I will pick this one up. This next one is a historical sort of family drama in memory of us by Jacqueline Roy. This is set in London about two um, sisters who are uh, members of the Windrush generation and it's told from the perspective of, of one of the sisters in a retirement home as she sort of looks back and uh, pieces together her history with her sister. Then one of the books that will help me with one of my goals to read translated fiction is Ellen and O's by Claudia Pinheiro, translated by Frances Riddle. Really want to read this. I'm in Excited about all of her other books as well, a few of which my library also have. Um, so yeah, definitely want to get to this. And another one that will help me with my non-fiction goal is Miss Major Conversations with a Black Trans Revolutionary, or sorry, Miss Major Speaks Conversations with a Black Trans Revolutionary um, by Toshia Merinek and Miss Major. There's a bit of grass on that because I took all my books into the garden yesterday um, when I was sort of having a look through them. So um, they were sitting on the grass for a while. So there's those ones, which I still intend to read and um, yeah, need to read in return as soon as possible. And then I have a stack of books that I only picked up a couple of days ago, haven't spoken to you about yet. And so I will somewhat quickly go through them because I think this video is incredibly long. The first one is a uh, woman's prize book and that is A Trace of Sun by Pam Williams. Um, quite funny because the other day my mum messaged me saying, oh, I've got this book to pick up from the library tomorrow. And um, my mum's a member of two libraries because of where she lives, she can be a member of two different county libraries, one of which is my county. And I was like, and it was this book. And I was like, I asked them to buy that book. So I should be the first person in the queue for it. So why are they offering it to you first? Which my mum thought was hilarious. But then the next day they added it to my list as well. So they'd obviously bought multiple copies, but still a little bit rude that they added it to someone else's list first, isn't it? Johnny thinks it's because they've got something against me because I borrow so many books, they just find me annoying. Um, let me know if you're a librarian. Is there people who constantly reserve books and constantly have loads of books to pick up who you find annoying? I feel like that would be a nice thing, but perhaps I am just an irritant to my library. So yeah, I, I really like the sound of this one. Um, I'm undecided as to whether I'll read this or audiobook it because there is an audiobook on Everand. Um, so yeah, my mum and I will probably buddy read that one. Then another one I asked my library to buy is Dancing in the Shallows by Claire Redaway. This is published by Fairlight Modern. I love how little these are and they always have a cute little painting on the front. Protagonist of this book is called Isla Wintergreen, which is a fabulous name. It says she hasn't seen her grandfather since she was seven, but when she unexpectedly inherits his cottage on the Isle of Skye, she cannot resist the opportunity to escape her purposeless life. That's all I need her to know. Young girl, grandfather, cottage on an island, yes please, I 100% want to read that book, so that sounds delightful. I saw a few people talk about this one, I'd never heard of it, um, but when people have been doing the booktube prize reviews, um, this was included in one of the groups, and that is Loved and Missed by Susie Boyt, and I thought it sounded a bit like the Mayor of Easttown without the crime stuff attached because it is about a mother whose adult daughter is I think a drug addict she has a child um, and there's concerns about her being able to raise the child I think so the the grandmother has to take her granddaughter in and so it's in part about her, her fractured relationship with her daughter and then in part about and um, what it's like for her to raise her granddaughter I've heard it's super emotional um, and I just yeah thought it sounded like the sort of book I could really enjoy so there we go. Um, another one I asked my library to buy because um, it's a, a new release and I thought it sounded really interesting and when I read the first couple of pages of all these books I thought that the first couple of paragraphs of this one were really compelling. Perhaps I'll read them to you. Um, and that is Headshot by Rita Bullwinkle. Now I am someone who is not a fan of any sort of sport that involves one person, one person trying to hurt another. I just, I just find that a kind of crazy thing about human society that we like 
want to go and watch people batter each other. Um, and I have this discussion with Johnny a lot because he watches a lot of um, what I would class as violent sports. Um, this is about, um, it's the story of eight of the best teenage girl boxers in the United States told over the two days of a championship tournament and structured as a series of face-offs. It says, this is a novel about the radicalness and strangeness of being physically intimate with another human when you are measuring your own body through competition against theirs. What does the intimacy of a physical competition feel like? What does it mean to walk through life in the bodies we've been given? And what does it mean to use those bodies with abandon? Um, any book that's set around a, a series of girls or women I'm interested in, but I think this is particularly interesting because this is focused on um, yeah, a sport that I wouldn't often associate with teenage girls. So I'll read you the first couple of paragraphs because I think they're super compelling. Andy Taylor is pumping her hands together, hitting her own flat stomach, thinking not of her mother sitting at home with her little brother, not of her car which barely got her here, not of her summer job, her lifeguarding at the overcrowded community pool, not of the four-year-old she watched die, the four-year-old she practically killed and his blue cheeks. They shouldn't give teenagers the job of saving children. It doesn't matter how many CPR classes you've taken. She killed the boy with her wandering eyes. His swim shoe had small red trucks on it. He looked like he was made out of plastic. The feel of a spy when she pulled him from the bottom of the pool, already dead, and it was so easy to grip because it was so small, she's not thinking about it. She's looking at the skylight and the light is letting in on this shithole gym, and she's thinking about the thing that she always does wrong when she fights. Her lazy left guard, the way her left hand slips away and doesn't protect her face if she's not thinking about it. She is also thinking about the way Artemis Victor will get her. If Andy Taylor doesn't think about this, this fight will be over in a matter of seconds. Andy Taylor needs to think about her spacing and her stomach. Andy Taylor needs to think about her stance. Um, yeah, I just thought that was like a really uh, excellent sort of electrifying opener. So very excited for this one. And then another book that will help me with my translated fiction um, endeavour is, I think you say this, Adnan, an epic by Linnea Axelsson. This is translated from the Swedish by Saskia Vogel, who is quite a well-known Swedish translator. This is sort of an epic in verse, so it's told like this. So it looks like quite a big book, um, but it will actually probably be quite a quick read. I'm kind of scared of this because it's being described as a mixture between myth and poetry, two things I'm not that comfortable with, but I really like the story it's, it's attempting to tell. Um, so this follows uh, the Sami people and it chronicles the fates of two indigenous Sami families um, over a century of colonial displacement, loss and resistance. Um, and I love the idea of following these families, but I'm unsure about how I will get on with the execution. Um, so we shall see. Again, very happy I asked my library to buy this. They kindly did. They've bought so many books this year at my request and it's been delightful. And then these last two books should help me with my hopes to read more non-fiction. Um, one of these I found while browsing, which I don't do very often in the library because I have way too many books on hold, but I had some time to kill. I saw this book and I was like, how the hell have I not heard of it? This is entirely the sort of thing I like to read. And that is Becoming Abolitionist, Police, Protest and the Pursuit of Freedom by Derricka Purnell. It says, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and the ensuing uprising, police abolition became a central demand for Black Lives Matter movement. We follow the author's uh, political awakening. It says, her life history and arguments make a powerful, passionate case for a society in which there is no place for state violence and racial repression. She confronts the history of policing as a means to capture runaway slaves and uphold white supremacy, a practice persisting today in the policing of Black people, poor people and disabled people on modern city streets. She argues that the worst of policing is the purpose of policing and that we need new systems to address the root causes of violence. This is um, something I read about earlier in the year in um, The End of Policing, which I didn't think was an entirely successful book. I think it was probably trying to cover too much in one book. This is much more focused and so I'm hoping um, this one will really work for me. And then the last one is another book I asked my library to buy um, and they very kindly did. And I think this sounds incredibly depressing, but so interesting. And I'm so glad someone has written a book on it. And that is Madness, Race and Insanity in America by Antonia Hilton. This is published by Footnote. The premise of this is that in 1911, state officials marched 12 black men into the heart of a forest in Maryland in the US. Under the supervision of a doctor, the men were forced to clear the land, pour cement, lay bricks and harvest tobacco. 
When construction finished, they became the first 12 patients of the state's hospital for the Negro insane. This hospital became the last, um, it was called an asylum at the time, the last segregated asylum in the US. And you follow the history of um, the treatment of black people in these type of institutions um, sort of throughout that period of American history. It sounds like it's going to be a difficult read, but focus on quite a few themes that I'm interested in, those being like the prison system and how a lot about the prison system is uh, really unethical and how in a lot of ways we, we use prisoners for work, in particular in the US, um, how prisons and psychiatric units can have a lot in common and also yeah, sort of the history of how race um, interplays with, with those things. So yeah, I think this sounds like a really interesting book and I'm, I'm going to pick this one up really soon. And then I also have a few memoirs um, that I've hauled recently and spoken about that I'm hoping to read to catch up on the memoir challenge. So I'm just really focused now on those two challenges of the Five Star Predictions and the Booktuber's Favourites, and then also reading books that will fulfil my other aims for the year. And not in a way where I'm like, oh, I need to catch up, but in a way where I'm like, I want to catch up because the reason I made these aims, maybe not for translated fiction, translated fiction was me recognising that I wasn't doing a very good job with reading translated fiction and was quite intimidated by it. But with non-fiction and memoir, it was me recognising that I love reading non-fiction and memoir, but just don't naturally reach for it as much and that needs to change. And so I really want to, um, just focus on that. So like I said, I'm super hopeful that I could be coming to you in the next couple of months with loads of um, really rave reviews. Um, I do need to catch up. I think I've only reviewed eight of the 26 books I've read so far. So you will see me a fair amount in the next week or so um, catching up and talking about all those books that I have read, some of which I've really, really enjoyed. So I'm excited to talk about them. So yeah, any thoughts you have on anything I said, please let me know down below any recommendations you have. I'd love to know your thoughts on any of the books I mentioned. Um, how are you? How is your reading going? All these things. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.